So I, yeah, I'm Luke Barnes. I work at Western Sydney University. I'm an astrophysicist by uh, training, by profession, uh, author of a couple of books. We can go through all of that. Uh, on the topic of books, a quick message from my mother. Dad has put a whole bunch of his books up the back. They're moving house. Please take them on behalf of mum. Please, just any, whatever you want to do, they prop up a table, please take them. So the history of science. Uh, in two hours is a bit of a challenge. Over the holidays, yeah, uh, over the holidays I read a book called The Mind of a Bee, all about bees and the history of people trying to understand what bee intelligence is like. That went for about 300 pages. So you can obviously spend 10 hours just on the history of the scientific study of the mind of bees and I've got the whole history of science to do in two hours. So this is going to be a bit of a challenge. The first question that we've got to ask ourselves is what actually do we want from the history of science? And this sounds like a bit of a distraction before we get into the real stuff, but if you want to follow this up and read more on the history of science, you need to know who you're getting it from. I'm a scientist. So on one end of the scale of what is the history of science, you have scientists who have, we get our pom-poms out, you get the, the, the winners. What I want from the history of science is who are the winners? Who discovered the things that I think are true of the universe around us? So. Uh, that on one end is, is a picture of science where I want to know who discovered what, how they did it, so I can give them credit and hopefully some inspiration and guidance. On the other end of the scale, there is science, according to, broadly speaking, the humanities, who treat scientists really as an alien tribe, as just a sort of bunch of people doing a whole bunch of fairly um, strange things uh, that they will try and interpret in their own particular way. So science, according to scientists, is the winners. And this is the danger of that end of the spectrum. What, what scientists want is for, we find the scientific ideas that are widely accepted today, say atomic theory, stuff is made out of atoms. We want to find the historical figure who first proposed or firmly established that idea. And then we want to declare them to be the winners of history. Uh, these are the geniuses. These are the paradigms of rationality. The problem off that end of the, that end of the scale is it can turn into hero worship. Later on, we'll be talking towards, we'll be spending a lot of our time working towards the scientific revolution, and at the center of that is Galileo. This is a book published recently by an astronomer, uh, Mario Livio, about Galileo, uh, called Galileo and the Science Deniers. It's a very modern uh, interpretation there. What Livio succumbs to is the sort of hero worship that goes off that end of the scale where Galileo becomes sort of the hero of the story. Now, there's a lot of good scientific information and historical information in there, but it prompted a number of interesting reviews by historians with titles like, You Are Not Galileo, uh, and an even more pointed one saying, How to Create Your Own Galileo. This one was particularly cranky. You probably can't read that, but it says, Writing this book review caused me a great deal of stress. From an actual historian of science who noted that because this is popular level, because it's by a scientist, most actual historians are going to ignore this book. And there's sort of, there's those two streams of where you get your history of science. But this particular historian had some rather interesting things to say of what we want to avoid off that end. Livio enters his story, he says, with a preconceived image of Galileo as a white knight on his mighty charger, fighting for freedom of speech and freedom of thought in the scientists, and as the originator and creator of modern experimental and mathematical science. With this image firmly in mind, from the start of his narrative, Livio uh, fills out the picture with a classic case of confirmation bias, which you all now know about, thanks to the previous hour. He completely ignores any real facts from the history of science that might force him to rethink the preconceived image of his hero. So that's one end of the scale. If you want to read about the history of science, you need to know if you um, want to be a science historian, it's just really a sort of cheerleader for science. At the other end of the scale, the people who treat scientists as an alien tribe, that might seem a little bit extreme, surely no one's really doing that. That is, in fact, a quote from this book, uh, An Introduction to Science and, Histori and Technology Studies by Sergio Sismondo. There is, in fact, a field in the university, an academic field called Science and Technology Studies, committed to studying the scientists, studying science as a social phenomenon explicitly treating them as, um, uh, for, uh, in the, here's a quote from Sismondo, 
in their well-known book Laboratory Life, Latour and Woolgar, two major uh, figures in this field, announced their intention to treat scientists as an alien tribe. Quote, since the turn of the century, scores of men and women have penetrated deep forests, lived in hostile climates, weathered hostility, boredom and disease in order to gather remnants of so-called primitive uh, societies. By contrast the to the frequency of these anthropological excursions, relatively few attempts have been made to penetrate the intimacy of life among tribes which are nearer at hand. This is perhaps surprising in view of the reception and importance attached to their product in modern civilized society. We refer, of course, to tribes of scientists and their production of scientists, of uh, science. So I read this book, had the weird um, you know, uh, experience of being watched. I am a scientist. There is a field dedicated to watching me as if I'm an alien. So here's how you do it if you want to treat scientists as an alien tribe. You find the ideas that are widely accepted in the scientific community. You assume this is a purely social, political or psychological phenomenon and then you explain the actions of the scientific community in terms of social, political and psychological factors and forces. Um, I heard about one particular attempt to do this. Uh, our understanding of gravity uh, really starts with Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton with his inverse square law. There's a pull between any two objects that have mass. How did he come up with this action at a distance law? Well, I heard uh, of a, a scholar who put forward the idea that because he'd lost um, his mother early in his life, he felt uh, that his mother was far away, he wanted there to be sort of action at a distance with his mother, and that this was the psychological force that drew him towards... Yeah, that's the right face. You're pulling the right face. I say that that sounds like bad history of science. It's actually very good <laughs> um, studies of technology and science. That, that's what you do in that field. The fact that it actually explains how the solar system works, it comes nowhere into that um, uh, explanation. It's important very quickly just to track where this idea comes from. And it comes from, uh, as Sismondo in his book explains, actually this book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions by Thomas Kuhn. Quick hand up, who's read this? Excellent. A couple. Um, I'm told that by a couple of metrics, this is the most cited book written in the 20th century. Depends which way you add them up. But that's astounding, because this is a very, I mean, history of science is a bit niche, right? But this is the book. The reason is precisely because it underscores uh, uh, an undermining of science as a purely social phenomenon. Very quickly, what Kuhn puts forward is the idea that science is just not the accumulation of data and scientists then drawing generalizations from them. There's a pattern to the history of science. There's a ruling idea called a paradigm which everyone in the scientific community uh, um, works under. They work under it because it is useful, but there's always some things that the paradigm can't quite explain at any particular point called anomalies. There's things that it just doesn't quite work, but those are the active research projects. You just get on with doing science to try and explain the anomalies. However, if enough of them arise, science may enter a period called crisis, where people, rather than trusting the paradigm and working to resolve anomalies, start wondering whether this paradigm is really the thing they should be go for. They go for someone in a, a fit of creativity proposes a new paradigm and uh, then there could be a paradigm shift towards this new idea. Now, we'll, we'll look, by looking at the scientific revolution, as we will, um, that's sort of the, the paradigm example of a paradigm, if you like, and it's um, the topic on which Kuhn was uh, an expert. Um, one of the things that makes Kuhn, that, that as history, there's a lot there that actually fits with the history of science. The step that takes us to the point where actually, now this now becomes um, of interest to the people who want to explain science as an alien tribe, is because Kuhn says that different paradigms are, here's your big word for the day, incommensurable. Here's a summary of what that idea means, not from Kuhn himself, but from uh, Alan Chalmers in his book, What Is This Thing Called Science? When one paradigm, one big idea about how the universe works, competes with another paradigm, there is no logically compelling argument that dictates a rational scientist should abandon one for the other. 
There's no single criterion by which a scientist must judge the merit or promise of a paradigm. And further, proponents of competing paradigms will subscribe to different standards and will even view the world in different ways and describe it in different languages. The aim of arguments and discussions between supporters of rival paradigms should be persuasion rather than compulsion. If you take that idea very seriously, as a lot of scientists who read Kuhn don't, if you take that idea seriously, you, you get the idea that these two subscribers to two different paradigms, they're really just two different social clubs defining who gets to be in the club. This makes it very confusing as to whether you can have anything known as scientific progress. Kuhn spent most of the second half of his career trying to say that he did really believe in scientific progress, even though his book slightly undermined it. So, for example, the second edition of this book was published in 1970, eight years after the first edition, 1962. Kuhn writes an um, afterword where he says things like, later scientific theories are better than earlier ones for solving puzzle, puzzles in the quite different environments in which they are applied. I'm a convinced believer in scientific progress. On the other hand, he also says in the same book, in a debate about paradigm cho uh, choice, their role is necessarily circular. Each group uses its own paradigm to argue in that paradigm's defense. Paradigm choice cannot be made logically or even probabilistically compelling. There is no standard higher than the assent of the relevant community. Now, you've all just done logic, so you should notice that those two statements are in fact contradictory. You can't say something's better than something else if there is no standard. This is the tension that Kuhn, in the most cited book of the 20th century, brings into the study of the history of science. And that this, this field of science and technology studies runs with one side of it, that science is just purely a social phenomenon. In the 1970s, after this second edition comes out, there's a group of, of philosophers, sociologists, and historians who uh, create what is known as the strong program for the sociology of science. They are going to try to explain not just the organization of science, but the content of scientific theories purely in social terms. And one of the things that means is they will explain things thought true in the same way that they would explain things thought to be false. So here's an example of that in action from Sismondo. Um, it, the, consider the Fuhrer over the work of Emanuel Velikovsky. In the 1950s, as a scholar um, who wrote a book called Worlds in Collisions, Velikovsky argued that historical catastrophes were the result of a near collision between Earth and a planet-sized object that broke off Jupiter. So he's, he's pulling together history and astronomy and trying to make this grand theory that um, a, a planet-sized object broke off Jupiter, it nearly collided with Earth, and that explains a whole bunch of stuff out of history. From within Sismondo's book, he quotes another scholar from science and technology studies, Molke, who says, quote, in February 1950, severe criticisms of Velikovsky's work were published in Science Newsletter by experts in the field of astronomy, geology, archaeology, anthropology, and oriental studies. In other words, everyone thought he was bonkers. What? The astronomer Harlow Shapley said Velikovsky's sensational claims violated the laws of mechanics. And here's the comment from the Science and Technology Studies scholar. Clearly, the laws of mechanics here operate as norms departure from which cannot be tolerated. A norm, a social norm, not a scientific one, sort of who gets to be in our gang, the sort of norm that says you don't wear, you know, thongs with a tuxedo. It's that sort of social phenomenon that's going on here. Um, whether, in fact, Velikov's, what, what Harlow Shapley means by violates the laws of mechanics is we've been watching the solar system for a couple of thousand years and it never does that sort of thing. Right? You've violated the laws of, of gravity, but if you've put aside the idea that you can explain the action to science as being a rational response to actual evidence, you have to now explain it in social terms. So, We've got sort of two flags here that we've got to swim inside of somehow. We need to somehow find a middle way for, for the history of science. Um, trying to think of science as humans 
trying to be rational about nature, which opens the possibility that they could be rational about nature and also the possibility that they might actually fail in this. The reason why people fall into these two extremes is because they're actually easier than going down the middle. Um, for the science, according to the scientists, the reason it makes it easy for me is I don't have to do too much science. I don't have to worry about all the people and all of their historical background and social background and all of that sort of stuff. I just need to find the winners and see what they do. Okay? Uh, there's a set of skills that historians have that most scientists don't have. If I wanted to study Newton's uh, work, uh, his classic work, Principia Mathematica, his laws of mechanics, and I go and find an original first uh, edition at the University of Sydney, and I'm going to study this. The first problem I have is it's written in Latin. I don't speak Latin because I'm a trained as a scientist. No one taught me Latin. But, so I want to oversimplify, right? I, I don't want to do the hard historical work of reading every historical source. It's, um, the reason why it's very easy to be on the other side it's because you don't actually have to understand the science. You don't have to actually understand whether someone's being rational. You don't have to worry about whether Velikovsky's claims actually violate the laws of mechanics. You can just explain everything in social terms, which is easy. We need to try and sort of go down the middle. There was a, a, a period, um, 70s and 80s, where there was something called the science wars, where these two sides really, the scientists and the sort of the humanities really clashed over this issue of what is science and things got quite polarised, someone made the wonderful comment that uh, apparently in this uh, debate, there's a, a, a school of philosophy which tries to take science and give it its most logical, um, rational, pure underpinnings in terms of, uh, of pure logic. It's called logical positivism. That's on one side, like the, the ultra science side. On the ultra other side, it's, it's amazing how often the people who turn up on that side are actually English professors. Uh, and so the, the, the characterization of this debate is either you are a logical positive or you are a gosh darned English professor. And we didn't actually say gosh darned, but you can fill in the details of the words I'm not using there. So we need to find the middle way, which is what I'm going to try and do today. However, this is important for if you want to go and study the history of science, if I inspire you in any way, um, you need to know where your source is coming on this particular scale. And me, I am a scientist. I'm, I'm going to wander over this way is my natural inclination. I'll try to go down the middle a bit more if I can. Well, let's get started after that longish introduction. Um, science is supposed to be the empirical study of nature. So it starts with the evidence of our senses and it aims for a knowledge of the natural world around us. And the first thing that needs to be said is that this is on this basic level of science, it really is almost a human universal. Um, every human society lives in contact with nature to some extent. And so you have to have some idea of what the natural world around you is doing. And the best tools you have for that are obviously your senses. Let me give an example of this. And I, I obviously can't resist the opportunity to teach you a little bit of astronomy. If you get outside on a lovely dark night and you look uh, now, it's going to help if you can actually see the video at this point. Otherwise, I'm going to describe it in very lucid terms. If you actually look around you at the night sky and really take some time to look at it, you'll notice a few things. Here's a video uh, slightly sped up. If you look towards the west, you'll notice that the stars are actually setting. The reason for this is the same reason the sun sets. It's not really setting. The earth is turning. For a similar reason, if you look to the east, you find that the stars are rising for the same reason. Again, stars rise in the east. If you look to the north, there we go, there's the east. If you look to the north, you'll see the stars going past you as if going past a window. Now, the key to this is actually to imagine us going to the right, not the stars going to the left. Good luck with that. Interesting thing happens if you look to the south, rather than just going past, there seems to be a point in the southern sky that the stars are actually rotating around. This is the south celestial pole. It's sort of about there somewhere. Um, as we do the freeze frame, you'll see it more clearly. Um, prize for anyone who knows why all the lights along the bottom of the screen were red. Cars. Nope, not cars. Oh, people. 
Lowest energy light, yes. So it's, it's you, when you go out to observe the sky, this is the astronomer talking, not the wannabe historian. Um, if you need to see around your telescope, you use a red light because it's less likely to mess up your night vision. So there you go, learns at least something. Why is there that pattern? Stars set in the west, rise in the east, go past in the north, circle around in the south. Well, we can understand it in terms of uh, the Earth and its relationship to the sun. Obvious reasons. When you're looking at the night sky, you're looking away from the sun. So if we're here in Australia, uh, at this point, the sun is sort of over to the west, so it's currently setting. The Earth rotates that way. You can work that out for yourself. So once we rotate a little bit, we're then looking away from the sun and we can see out into the night sky. There's one other little detail we need to add to this picture, which is that um, the angle of the Earth is, uh, uh, axis of rotation is tilted at 23 degrees. That's important for the seasons. So what you'll see then is if we put all of this in the context of the night sky around us, Think of what you see as the sun, as the, as the earth turns. Um, when you get out of sight of the sun and look to the west, you see the closer side of the sphere around it. And so you see those stars as the ones that set in the, set, uh, in the west, the ones that you lose sight of as the earth turns. The ones that rise in the east are over the other side of the sphere. And as the night continues, you get to see more and more of those stars as the earth turns around. If you look to the north, you're seeing these stars up near the, the celestial equator. Those ones will simply go past. But because the, or, the axis of the orbit of the Earth, uh, the axis of the ro orbit of rotation of the Earth uh, points down here, there are stars down the bottom which you will actually see rotate around that southern celestial pole. The easiest way to think about that is if you were standing at the South Pole and you looked straight upwards, the rotation of the Earth would simply turn you around where you were and the stars there would not move, right? Because I'm doing this, okay? As you move away from the pole, that the point where the stars don't move would still be there in the night sky. Here's the important point. If six months later you try and do the same thing, so let's just move the Earth, hey, we're definitely not to scale now, uh, around the other side of the sun, if you want to see these stars over here, you've, you've got a problem, they're behind the sun. So if you wait until the night sky is around, you're not going to look this way, you need to look that way. The reason why the stars that are there up, especially up in the north, are different at different times of the year is just because the night sky is looking away from the sun and at one point of the year you look this way and the other point of the year you look that way. What that means is all of these stars, there's a time when they rise in the east when the sun is setting and there's a time when they will set just after the sun depending on the time of year. All of that to say this, the stars are your calendar. If you know the stars and you can see when they rise and set relative to when the sun rises and sets, you know what time of year it is. What time of year it is also matters to agriculture. If you want to eat, whether you're doing agriculture, actually whether you're hunter-gatherer or whatever it is you want to do, you know, to need to know what time it is to know what time to plant or to till or to harvest or to collect or to do whatever. And if you've worked out that the stars will tell you that, there's a connection now between you being able to eat and you knowing how nature works. The stars are your calendar. A certain constellation will rise just as the sun sets at a certain time of year. And if you're clever, you'll know, okay, that's a, I've just seen that constellation rise. It's time to go and plant this field or go and check the river for this sort of fish or whatever. So let's give a quick example of this in action. Um, in Aboriginal astronomy, interesting book there by uh, Dwayne Hamaka, I believe that's pronounced. Um, they have all sorts of stories about the sky which are connected to the land for obvious reasons. It's your calendar. When you see this in the sky, you go and do something on the land. Um, how good is there, are their observations? Well, here's an example. In most Aboriginal cultures, the moon is a uh, bad, fat man and the sun is female, and a solar eclipse, just so you remember, a solar eclipse is when the moon gets in the way of the sun, casting a shadow. Um, so during the day, the, the sun goes dark for a moment. Uh, quote, the sun woman is being covered by the moon man. 
That's impressive because although it's expressed in those terms, that's actually the, the right explanation. The sun is covered by the moon. The reason that's impressive is a couple of things. One, it's not obvious if you're there, right? On July 22nd, 2028, there'll be a solar eclipse in Sydney. So put that in your diaries. If you're watching it, you don't see the moon come across. The sun just goes out for a bit and then comes back. And it's not obvious what's going on. To work that out, you have to have a good idea of where the moon would be at the time when the eclipse happens. Um, the other thing is, in any particular place, uh, solar eclipses don't happen very often, sort of roughly every 10 generations. So if you want to be able to work out what's really going on here, you have to, A, be thinking about what happens in the sky, be, be thinking that things are predictable up there, the sun just didn't go out for no reason. And you have to preserve that knowledge for at least 10 generations at any particular point and you know, share it around and pass it on down. So this connection between the sky and the land is there in, in just about every culture. Aboriginal culture is a very good example. As we move towards science as we probably think of it, we need to move ourselves to sort of the fertile crescent, rough, you know, that rough area of the world around the Mediterranean. So we arrive in ancient Egypt. Again, that connection between the, the, the sky and the land is, is fairly obvious. Um, if you want to do anything interesting in Egypt, you need to be following the Nile and its progress <laughs> very carefully. It's your only source of water, roughly. Um, once a year in August or September, the Nile floods. When the waters recede in October, there will be a crucial strip of farming land will have a fresh layer of soil. So that's the time to have everything ready for and then to go and plant your uh, crops, and then everyone gets to eat. The way that you make sure everyone's ready for that is you have to get your calendar right, and you have to make sure everyone's on board for it. So you need to sort of um, get all of nature's cycles ready to go with a bunch of social cycles as well, so that everyone knows what's going on at harvest time, at planting time, at all those sorts of things. So there's uh, a way in which um, all of these fit together with what are sort of pejoratively called the myths. So the myth of Isis and Osiris, of a, of, of, a, um, of a god murdered by a jealous brother who is restored to the king of the underworld, represents a cycle of life and death. You do the religious um, you know, actions in the temple and you remember what time of year it is. So you, all of those uh, different parts come together. The Egyptians are sort of famously good at doing astronomy. All of the um, pyramids, for example, point exactly north to the celestial North Pole, the equivalent of the South Pole. There's one in the north as well. Um, there are te the Temple of Amun-Ra in Karnak. At the shortest day of the year, the sun shines exactly down the main sort of thoroughfare through the temple. Um, I don't have much time to go into it, but there is, uh, the Egyptians are also very interested in medicine, obviously, because they have bodies. That's another field of science, which is obviously very crucial and doesn't wait around for the scientific revolution before anyone thinks about how they might look after their own bodies. Now, is this science? Well, it's not science as we know it, but it's certainly trying to understand the natural world in terms of uh, observations. Um, if we move slightly later and slightly further north to Babylon, the Babylonian Empire in about 600 BC. Uh, this, is a, this is the Fertile Crescent, obviously known um, like that because it's particularly good for agriculture. The thing about the Babylonians, again, trying to, trying to summarize a very small slice uh, of uh, their culture is they were extremely good at keeping astronomical records. And it was the priests who kept astronomical records. They would keep very, uh, they were called astronomical diaries, or we call them that. The rising and setting times of the moon each night, the positions of the planets, and all of that night after night. Um, for example, they worked out that in every 47 years, Mars would wander past all the stars 25 times. So there was that ratio of 47 years, 25 times. The reason that's crucial is if you want to know what Mars is going to do tonight, you can go check the records from 47 years ago, because it'll be in roughly the same place. So if your records are good, and you know that the night sky has these cycles, you can predict those. 
they do, well, so why did they do all of this? And at this point, as well as you know, the agricultural calendar, um, and it's this point that um, astronomy's sort of embarrassing distant relative comes into the picture, the answer is astrology. If the night sky affects Earth in ways that we understand, obviously the sun affects us, the moon controls the tides, we know that there's cycles up there that we can understand, it's not a completely ridiculous idea to think that other astronomical bodies might affect us as well. Um, turns out not to be entirely correct, right? Don't go and read your horoscopes after this, please. Um, if you ever meet another astronomer and you want to just annoy them immediately, I don't know why you would, but here's how to do it. They say, oh, I'm an astronomer. I go, oh, I'm a Sagittarius. <laughs> um, if you're going to try to do that, to try to work that out, do the positions of the heavenly bodies affect the way that uh, you know, people born at that time behave? And, and do they give you know, ominous predictions of the near future for wars and famines and all those sorts of things? You'd better keep very good records of the night sky. We'll see later uh, um, Ptolemy is a Roman um, astronomer working about 100 second century AD, when he puts together his astronomical work, he can say that he is relying on 800 years of astronomical records come before him. And that a lot of that's um, in the Babylonian. So there's, for example, a mention of Halley's Comet, what is later known as Halley's Comet, in 164 BC. Inevitably, we arrive at Greece, where something more like modern science really starts to emerge. Now, again, there are a lot of important thinkers here, but cannot really be blamed for focusing on Aristotle. So, um, in the New Testament, uh, it, it says of uh, Athens that all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Sort of intellectual culture, to some extent, going on there. And that's not in the Greek era, right? So that's, that's later on. So here's... Um, Famous, this is 1511, Raphael's um, School of uh, Athens, famous fresco, where all of the, um, the, 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 all of the great Greek thinkers are sort of portrayed as being standing around debating and talking. And so there's Plato and Aristotle there uh, in the middle. Had the great opportunity earlier this year to be there as well. Uh, so there's a bunch of great thinkers and my stupid head. Here's... here's Here's an oversimplification of what leads Aristotle to his position. There's a debate between the school of Parmenides and the school of Heraclitus. This is a massive oversimplification, but here we go. They're thinking about change, just the idea of change. And um, Parmenides says that when something changes, it ceases to be itself. Right? So if I took that chair and I compared it to another chair which was identical but white, we would say those are different chairs because they have different colours. Okay, suppose I take that chair and I paint it white. We just said that a, you know, a blue chair and a white chair are different chairs. And so now the chair afterwards is a different chair to the chair that's there now, right? Because a white chair can't be a blue chair. And so the thing has ceased to be itself. So how can I say the chair changed colours if it's now a different chair? Do I have to say that the blue chair popped out of existence and a white chair popped into existence. Parmenides takes this as a sign that actually the idea of change is, a con is contradictory. Maybe you followed that, maybe you didn't. The point is that his slogan, it's a great slogan, whatever is, is. One of the great philosophical slogans. But you can get the point that he's making. Um, Heraclitus, on the other hand, looks around and only sees change. There is no such thing as being, so for example, you cannot step in the same river tw twice. If I step in a river and then I get out of it, by the time I've stepped back in again, the river's slightly different. All the water's moved a little bit. There's no such thing as the river. How can I talk about the river as something that, that persists over time if it's constantly changing? So between these two um, ideas of being, what something is, and becoming, what something changes into, there's debate over which one of these is more real. Into that steps Aristotle. Um, there's his years there, 384 to 322 BC. What Aristotle proposed was a way to understand change, as well as 
what the things that I am, the things that any object in the world is, what its being is, there's also a way that it potentially could be. Change isn't something coming out of nothing, it's a potential something becoming an actual something. So a caterpillar doesn't have wings, but it potentially has wings. So when it changes into a butterfly, it doesn't, it's not that a caterpillar stops existing and a butterfly starts existing, a potential caterpillar, uh, sorry, butterfly becomes an actual butterfly. The important thing about these potentials is it's not just our imagination, they are really a property of the object. A caterpillar really has the potential to have wings. It doesn't have the potential to melt into a puddle of water. A cube of ice has the potential to melt into a puddle of water. It doesn't have the potential to grow wings. The reason this is important is it's in these potentialities that we understand the order of nature. Nature is an orderly place because, it has a, because things in nature have a finite set of potentials. The reason anything can't turn into anything is because you know, caterpillars can't just melt into a puddle of water, is because it doesn't have that potential. This now gives the framework, the philosophical framework we're going to use to understand nature. What actually exists, and as well as that, what are the potencies, what are the potentials that the really existing things actually have, and how are they then actualized in the world? The caterpillar exists, its potential to grow wings actually exists. How is it then that it actually grows wings? Those are the questions we're going to use to try and understand the world. The way Aristotle actually does it, um, in terms of, uh, for example, physics, is that he thinks that the world is fundamentally composed of four elements, fire, air, water, and earth, and I'll put them in that order, because they have a natural place, and this is where the explanation uh, in this uh, fourfold division actually comes in. The natural place of earth is below water, the natural place of water is between uh, air and earth, and so on and so forth. Remember, earth in this case is a type of substance, okay, as well as being the name of our planet. Good way to remember that um, is the following joke by Norm MacDonald, who said, uh, all of the planets are named after Roman gods, except for earth, which is named after all that stuff on the ground. That's how you remember there's two meanings for Earth. Um, violent motion is motion away from the natural place. If I take a lump of Earth and I throw it into the air, all right, feel free to do this experiment at home, uh, it will then seek its natural place, which is with the rest of the Earth down there. Once it reaches its natural place, it stays there because it's in its natural place. If you are uh, uh, in a pool, say, of water, and you get your hands and you shove a bunch of air underneath, you put some bubbles under the water, the reason they rise to the top is that they're seeking their natural place, which is above water. The reason fire goes up is its natural place, is above the air, it's trying to get up. This actually does some decent work of explaining some things. If you then look up at the night sky, you have to change the rules because everything is just going around in perpetual motion, so to speak. Aristotle says that, therefore, the heavens must be made out of a different type of stuff. All motion, right, comes to stop on the earth when something stops pushing it. That marker is going to stay there for as long as we leave it there. But the heavens keep going around. So Aristotle says there must necessarily be some simple body which revolves naturally. Its natural motion is not towards the earth, but in a circle. There is in nature some bodily substance other than the formations, the elements, earth, fire, wind, water, we know, prior to them all and more divine than they. And I think by that he means with, uh, you know, more pure as a substance. That's the way Aristotle puts his physics together. And it does a decent job of explaining some stuff. Um, just to point out uh, that they knew the Earth was round. We have to keep knocking this particular myth on its head. Everyone knew the Earth was round. Not only that, but in 200 BC, Eratosthenes had actually measured the radius of the Earth. There's a neat geometry uh, trick. You can use the rays of the sun. If there's a place 
that they knew there was a place in uh, Syene where at uh, one particular time of year, at midday, there was no shadow down a well. You could look down a well and it was just perfectly sunlit on every side, which says that the sun was exactly overhead. On the same day, it was not true at Alexandria, a pole there would actually cast a shadow. With a bit of geometry and a bit of cleverness, if you can measure that distance, you can measure the radius of the Earth. It's a, it's a, it, there's some debate about how accurate this is. There's actually a, a PhD student at Western Sydney University who was a historian, came to us as the astronomers, just did his PhD thesis on how accurate was this. Uh, it depends on um, the definition of a stadia and a whole bunch of interesting other things. Uh, and also how accurate his, um, the, the measuring equipment was to measure angles, uh, which led to him, this guy, Chris Matthews is his name, by the way, uh, he constructed a, a replica of the kind of instrument that uh, Eratosthenes would have used. And there's a, a lovely coincidence there. Uh, you'd think you'd have to go to Alexandria in Egypt to actually measure this, but that's a certain distance to the north. You can get a, the, same sort of, um, ex, uh, the same sort of measurement if you go the, the same sort of angle to the south, um, which instead of having to catch a plane to Alexandria, you get to just drive to Crescent Head and go and do your experiments on the north coast and enjoy the beach, which he did. Um, here's, here's some examples of Aristotle's physics in action. Aristotle says, heavy uh, bodies forcibly thrown straight upward. Whoa. You gonna do the experiment again? You throw something straight up, it, it returns to the point from which it started. From these considerations, it is then clear that the Earth does not move and does not lie anywhere elsewhere than the center. If the Earth is rotating, we're all currently going east at about 500 meters a second. In that case, when I throw the, uh, um, the pen in the air, why doesn't it suddenly fly off to the west at 500 meters a second? It's not being pushed. Um, it's only when you get a new understanding of the way uh, emotion works that you actually understand what's wrong with that argument. But on Aristotle's physics, that's a very good argument for why the Earth doesn't move. Secondly, the Earth's shape must, be necessar must necessarily be spherical. For the center of the Earth has weight, for every portion of the Earth has weight until it reaches the center, and the jostling of parts greater and smaller would bring about not a waved surface, but rather compression and convergence of part on part until the center is reached. And that's a really good argument that we still hold to. The reason the Earth is round is because all the forces are pushing towards the center. If you try and build, you've, you've done this, if you try and build a sandcastle too high, it will eventually sort of collapse on itself under its own weight. Mountains are the same. You have, the, there's a calculation you can do, no mountain actually gets there for obvious reasons. If you try and make a mountain high enough on the Earth's surface, the bottom will liquefy and it will do that again. That's not what actually happens in mountains, but that's what would happen. So there's one bad argument and one good argument for why the Earth is stationary and why it must be spherical. But there's physics in action, trying to understand, um, really natural science in action, trying to understand the way the world works in terms of deeper principles of how the world works. Uh, there's a myth about Aristotle that he uh, did all his philosophizing from an armchair. That is not true, especially if you read his work in biology. There's all sorts of really fascinating and detailed uh, observations there of the way the natural wo um, world works. In particular, he obviously dissects chicken eggs an awful lot. There's a very detailed discussion of the way a chicken embryo um, progresses inside an egg. It's very clear that he's done the hard work himself. Wonderful book here by, called The Lagoon by Leroy um, on all of, and Aristotle as a biologist. Uh, he tries to understand nature in terms of four causes, efficient causes, formal causes, final causes, and, uh, sorry, material causes and final causes. So if we're thinking of sort of a house, um, who built the house? How was the house built? Uh, what is it that makes it a house rather than something else? What is it made out of? And the final cause is what does it achieve? Sometimes the final cause is, is, uh, is thought of as what was the builder's idea in mind? What was their intention? What was the, the purpose of the house? It's actually slightly more general than that. That's an example of a final cause, but it's bigger than that. What does 
um, the house actually achieve in this, you know, in a case of a house, it's shelter. Um, these are very useful questions to ask, especially the final cause one. If you're trying to understand, say, what your organs do in your body, say the kidney, you can ask, how is the kidney, you know, how does it develop in a newborn embryo, human embryo, say? You can ask, what is it that makes it a kidney rather than, say, a liver, its structure? You can ask, what's it made out of? You don't really understand a kidney until you understand, oh, it's a filter. It filters your blood, that's its final cause. Right, that's what it does. All right, so we've just dipped a little bit here into the ocean of Greek thought, but what we've got here is um, a society, uh, uh, well, not an entire society, at least some members of the society who are committed to applying reasoning to answer questions about the world around them, uh, and particularly who want natural knowledge of the world, who know the importance of careful observation of the world, at least some of them do. There are some who want to do armchair philosophy, as there always are. But we see something here that's coming close to at least what looks like modern science. I'm going to keep moving forward here. There's a, a story that uh, after the Greeks and the Romans that science just sort of dies because the Christians say, take over and we're all terrible, as you may have heard. Um, the next bit of this, as we move towards the scientific revolution for the second half, uh, we just want to sort of bonk that idea on the head. Um, so the Roman Empire, here's a, just a quick map of the Roman uh, Empire in 117 AD. Uh, Rome becomes the superpower of this region in the second century BC. Importantly, they don't simply annihilate the culture that came before them and announce theirs to be the greatest and uh, just sort of start from scratch again. They have a lot of respect for Greek learning and so the works of the Greeks, the scientists, the philosophers, um, are preserved and actually that's one of the criticisms of science so to speak, under Rome is that they were more interested in producing encyclopedias than they were in producing new knowledge. So uh, a, a historian of science I was writing was, uh, said that Roman science tended towards being encyclopedic rather than inquisitorial. So you have these m wonderful volumes. This is Pliny the Elder um, from 23 to 79 AD, um, dies in uh, the eruption of Vesuvius. He has a 10-volume encyclopedia that covers all of the knowledge he could get his hand on of the natural world, astronomy, meteorology, geography, anthropology, zoology, botany, pharmacology, all of it, try to get it into one place. Now, this actually seems to have created a sort of a problem. It was easier to look up Pliny's work than to actually go and read Aristotle for yourself. And so these encyclopedias the Lat in Latin start to replace the Greek originals. And so uh, in the late Roman era, you actually have more of these encyclopedias than you have the original works of Aristotle. Um, one of the most important thinkers, especially as we move towards the scientific revolution, is Claudius Ptolemy, who I uh, mentioned before. Here is his book, uh, known as the Almagest, though it wouldn't be called that until later, we'll see why. What it is, is a way of calculating where all of the objects in the night sky are going to be at any particular time. Um, this is, it's actually in Victoria, this is a, um, a version from 1200, but this particular book is obviously written in the second century. Uh, what Ptolemy realizes is that Aristotle's idea of how the universe works isn't quite working. As I said before, he's got 800 years of, of observations of where everything is in the night sky. You can take Aristotle's universe and try to calculate where things are going to be, and they are consistently in the wrong place. So here's what, um, here's Aristotle's universe. The Earth is at the center, as we saw, because Earth goes to its natural place, which is, must be at the center. What Ptolemy realizes is he can fix some of these predictions make much more accurate predictions if he takes the Earth and he puts it slightly away from the center of the universe. And in particular, the planets and the sun that go around the Earth don't just go in circles, they go in circles on circles. These are called epicycles. If you do that, then suddenly all these uh, 
predictions get a whole lot better. Now, mathematically this works to some extent. It's much better than that, that's for sure. In terms of the physics of Aristotle, this makes no sense whatsoever. Right? What, that's the center of the universe. What's the Earth doing out there? Why isn't it falling towards the center? I mean, the whole point of the circles was it's the perfect symmetrical figure. In fact, um, you shouldn't really think of these as circles. They're crystalline spheres. And the planet travels around on these crystalline spheres. Um, this is the way that people are taught to calculate things in the universe, if, uh, in, in um, you know, calculate their uh, calendar. And it, it's important to realize how much this affects not just the sort of the technical astronomers, but any learned person knows about the fact that these Greek and Roman ideas really can predict some stuff in the universe. So here's a really interesting example um, from uh, the fifth century with Augustine, a famous figure who you hopefully know about. Um, in his confessions, he gives his sort of life story and the progress that he made towards where he eventually uh, became a Christian. At one point in his life, he's in a sect called the Manichees. Um, and they have all of these, you know, fascinating myths and stories about how the heavens work and how the world works and all of that sort of stuff. And our, uh, Augustine is starting to question these. And here's what Augustine writes. A certain Manichaean bishop, Faustus by name, had lately arrived in Carthage, where Augustine was. Many people were ensnared by the per persuasive sweetness of his eloquence. Now, I had read widely in the works of philosophers. They discovered much and predicted eclipses of the sun's light or the moon's many years in advance, indicating precisely the day, the hour, and the extent of the eclipse, and their calculations have been accurate. So there's the two groups. There's the Manichees, the group that he's involved in, and then there's these philosophers who say a whole bunch of different stuff about the universe, but they actually calculate where eclipses are going to happen and they get it right. It's impressive. I then compared these philosophers with the assertions of Manny, the founder of the Manichees, who had written voluminous, uh, voluminously and incoherently on these subje uh, subjects what I read there was confirmed neither by rational account of solstices and equinoxes and eclipses, things in the night sky, nor by anything else I had learned from books of secular philosophy. I was simply bidden to believe. When Faustus, this great uh, Manichaean, turns up, he asks all these questions of Faustus. Faustus doesn't have any ideas otherwise, and so uh, Augustine writes, Thus this Faustus, who was a death trap for many, unwittingly and without intending it, began to spring the trap in which I was caught. He leaves the Manichaeans and continues his progress towards Christianity. But that's an interesting point there that, you know, you can have all your stories about the night sky, but these philosophers actually predict where eclipses happen. They can tell you when the sun's going to go out, right? That's impressive. I mean, literally 20 minutes ago, I told you there's going to be one in Sydney on July 22nd, 2028, and no one gasped. You're sort of all used to this idea. I just predicted something that's going to happen in five and a half years' time. And I'm right, <laughs> unless the Lord returns, of course, but, you know, we can do that sort of thing. Um, it's sometimes hard to get a handle on how much these works actually affect the common people. So it, it's very useful when they turn up in something that's meant at a more popular level. We're going to jump about a thousand years into the future now, but the Almagest, Ptolemy's work, turns up in the Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer. In 1390, he writes The Miller's Tale, and he's got a, his main, one of his main characters there is a sort of young, handsome, cosmopolitan, sophisticated kind of guy. Um, and he says about this guy, um, and alone lived there without company, all garnished with sweet herbs of good repute, and he himself sweet smelling as the root of licorice, valerian, and setwall, his almagest. And books, both great and small, his astrolabe belonging to his art, his algorithm, algorithm stones all laid apart on shelves that ranged beside his lone bed's head. How do you show that a guy in um, 1390 is a cosmopolitan, well-read kind of guy? He's got a copy of the Almagest. There's the, if you can read it, <laughs> I'm told that says Almagest. I'm not going to pretend I can read that. Um, the astrolabe is an astronomical instrument before the telescope. So um, this, 
this knowledge that we can actually predict the way the world works is at least out there. So Chaucer doesn't expects his audience to know what an almagest is. So let me, in the last couple of minutes, uh, just sort of uh, stride quickly through uh, the next couple of centuries here. As Rome falls in um, sort of the fifth century, uh, there's, there's for, for the reasons sort of <laughs> shown here, they get invaded by everybody. Um, I won't try and do Roman history here for you. What happens to this knowledge that is sort of preserved uh, from the Greeks, preserved and slightly added to by the Romans? We find it in, in all sorts of places. Uh, it is very much preserved and added to in this sort of the early Middle Ages between, say, 500 and 1,000. Here's an example. Uh, the Venerable Bede is a monk who runs a school for a religious school. He's in the north of England. Um, in 725, he writes a book called The Reckoning of Time. And, and just to be clear that he knew the earth was round, here is his, uh, the reason why the same calendar days are on equal length is the roundness of the earth. For not without reason, it is called the orb of the world on the pages of Holy Scripture and in ordinary literature. Uh, in fact, it is in fact a sphere in the middle of the whole universe. It is not merely circular like a shield or spread out like a wheel, but resembles more a ball being equally round in all directions. Um, couldn't be clearer. Uh, he writes a book, a textbook for his students called On the Nature of Things. Fantastic title. You write anything in a book called On the Nature of Things. And here's, here's the contents page. And it's literally just everything he can get his hands on about the natural world and write down. From the planets, astronomy, the Milky Way, uh, eclipses, are there, they're uh, important. Uh, comets, thunder, lightning, down to weather, uh, oceans, tide, uh, why the sea is bitter. Um, the circles of the earth, earthquakes, it's all there. Uh, most of the education in, in the West is happening in these sort of monastery schools. Uh, in the Arabic world, they've also got a handle on the idea that these Greeks know an awful lot. The school of Baghdad in around the 9th century um, gets a hold of the works of Aristotle and the greatest Roman uh, writers of the time and preserves them. They have a, a sort of uh, great libraries there where they, they copy out these books. Um, Almagest, Ptolemy's work, the Almagest, just means the greatest in Arabic. It's an Arabic word. Uh, there are, if I knew more about this subject, I would love to dig a bit deeper into these Arabic scholars. I don't know that much. Uh, I know there are some great names here. They do make um, advances as well as commentaries on the works of Aristotle. Um, they seem particularly interested in uh, agriculture for ob obvious reasons and optical lenses. Um, they get quite good at that. There is a correct explanation of, for example, the rainbow uh, developed in the Arabic world that is in fact sort of reflection from a whole bunch of um, uh, uh, small uh, objects. And just before I finish, before we start the, the, the build up towards the scientific lit um, uh, revolution, um, one of the scholars here is Avicenna. Uh, that's his, he's known in Latin as Ibn Sina, if you can actually speak Arabic. Probably pronounce it better than I can. Avicenna gets a mention in Chaucer as well. Chaucer is trying to say that someone, uh, one of his characters is poisoned. I think actually it's two people. And what he says is that the reaction that they have to this poisoning is so spectacular, you wouldn't even read about it in Avicenna. That's his way of saying he, all the medical knowledge we have is from this guy and uh, here's something in his, 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 um, his story so amazing you wouldn't even read about it where all the knowledge is from these Arabic sort of uh, um, encyclopedists and copyists and um, um, scholars. So we sort of fast forwarded through. We're going to turn our attention next to the 12th century the information about the Greeks starts to filter back into the West from the Arabic world, and we'll see how that drives the, the motion towards what we know and now is modern science. So I'll leave it there. It's 11.31. We break for uh, 25, minutes. 25 minutes. All right. Thank you very much.